This week on the Blue Crew, I am very honored to welcome on a guy that I happened to meet in the elevator at the Prudential Center in round one of the Stanley Cup playoffs last year. Was lucky enough to have a drink with him at the eighth wonder of the world, the Elbow Room in Fort Lauderdale. ESPN broadcaster, legendary anchor, celebrating 30 years at ESPN, the face of NHL on ESPN. Welcome to the show, Steve Levy. Steve, how are you? Good, Johnny. Thanks for that introduction. I appreciate that. All good things. Let's do it again sometime. Yeah, of course. It's tough to introduce you because I've been watching you my whole life and I'm used to you introducing people. But being on the flip side, uh, I tried to do my best. And off the jump here, I know, you know, you're celebrating three decades at ESPN. Unbelievable accomplishment. You grew up in Long Island from Belmore, spent a lot of time in Boston. But to your core, are you a suffering New York sports fan just like the rest of us? Yeah, I sat at that Jets Chargers game. I waited until (laughs) Warning on Monday night. I dragged my kids along too, dealt with all the parking and the traffic and all that is MetLife Stadium. And it was awful. And I kept kicking myself. Why do I keep doing this to myself? And why do I keep doing this, start doing this to my kids too? It's not fair to them, you know. But as uh, as my colleague Scott Van Pelt says, um, nobody gets to choose where they come from. You know what I mean? And you can see I still got the Jets thing over my shoulder here. So. <laughs> That's uh, that's the really the only team I actually still root for mm-hmm. professional sports. Everything else I root for guys I like and coaches I like and those kinds of things. But uh, I still root for the New York Jets organization. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect segue. And I know this is a Rangers show, but I'm going to stick to baseball here. Okay. I wanted to go past Wikipedia when, you know, researching you for this interview. So I turned to my dad, who's a 59 year old man who grew up in Roslyn, Long Island. Yeah. And I said, Dad, you got to have some mutual friends with Steve Levy. There's no way you don't. So I received this picture over text, and I'm going to read the text message that I got. Okay. Does this ring a bell? Yeah. Uh, Carrie and Glenn and Eric Spitz. Yeah. So I got a text that says, tell Johnny to ask Steve if he still thinks the Mets suck. That picture was taken at a Mets suck party in Eric and Steve's apartment in Queens. They all worked at the fan except Glenn, and they were tired of the Mets sucking so bad that they decided to have a party in their honor. So, yeah, Eric Spitz, who was one of the big head honchos at Sirius XM now and all that stuff, he was my roommate. We lived in Regal Park in Queens together for, I don't know, five years. I was We were both commuting to Astoria at WFAN at the time. And, um, and yeah, the Mets went <laughs> through some tough years. But I got that out of my – because in 86, I was there. My folks let me come home from college. I was at the Bill Buckner game. I was at game seven and all that. And so that had allowed me to move on past the Mets thing. I saw the Rangers win growing up. I was in the mm-hmm. building at the Garden. I was in the dressing room that night, game seven against Vancouver. And so that's really why I'm just sort of stuck on the Jets still. Just waiting for them to get the championship. Your dad's, your dad's buddy is Glenn or Carrie or Eric? Uh, Eric. Oh, okay. Yeah. Eric. Um, yeah, I received that. And I was like, I got to bring that up in the interview, of course. That's hilarious. <laughs> But, you know, speaking of Game 7 against Vancouver in 94, you obviously work with Mark Messier, a New York Rangers legend. Henrik Lundqvist is being inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame this coming week. Yeah. And this is, a, this is a curveball for you. This is a hard one. Yeah. Who is the more decorated New York Ranger, in your opinion, Mark Messier or Henrik Lundqvist? Oh, that's not difficult at all. It's, it's, it's Mark Messier. You think so? I think so, yeah. It's a, it's a born of bottom line business here. Uh, I feel like he carried the city on his shoulders. Uh, I feel the weight of that C on a sweater is a real thing. And while, you know, Hank deserves all the accolades and uh, backstopping the Rangers and getting them to the cup final and all those great years. And I'm not sure he always had great teams in front of him, but, you know, he was always great and kept Rangers in those games. Uh, but it's it's Messier for me and not just because he would cross check me in the teeth if I had said otherwise. I was going to say, you might have to be careful when you answer that one, but I, I think it's definitely a, a tough response. I've asked this question in the past and, you know, I think a lot of my generation w- would say Lundqvist just because, you know, lifelong Ranger spent his whole career with one team where Messier, yep. you know, won a lot of cups in Edmonton. But then again, Messier is the hero. Henrik is the king. It's two different things, but. Yeah, the hero and the king, right. So, and, you know, and for Messier, yes, he won the other cups elsewhere, but he, he changed the fate of the organization for me. I think people look differently at the Rangers when Messier showed up, there's some, there's some legendary stories and, and maybe you have heard it. Maybe you haven't like his day one in the Ranger dressing room. Did you hear about the trash can? Did you ever hear about that one? No. What's that? So um, apparently mess sat down in his stall at the garden in the dressing room. And uh, he couldn't see everybody's eyes. He couldn't see the face of every player. They were like these, you know, trash cans. Just, mm-hmm. Hey, you've been in an NHL dressing room as I know you have. There's, there's yeah. tons of trash everywhere, right? There's stick tape and, 
all sorts of disgusting things you know, on the floor and everything. So you need trash cans. But I guess Mess had all the trash cans in the middle of the room removed. He wanted to be able to see and look into the eyes of every single player in the room. And that's kind of one of those legendary behind the scenes stories, as I understand it. And, you know, one of the reasons he was such a great captain, such a great leader, and, and maybe the greatest leader and captain in all of sports, not just hockey. Yeah, I wonder if actually that's the transformation as to why most locker rooms, not only NHL, but even college level are now circle instead of square. You know, I know when I was growing up, a lot of rooms were square and you, you know, you're in the corner seat. Yeah. See someone down the row. So I actually wonder if that's what, you know, maybe changed the locker rooms to begin with. But, you know, back to ESPN a little bit. Obviously, it's a very exciting year. ESPN has coverage of the Stanley Cup final again this year. Uh, I loved the, you know, reply all email commercial that aired a couple of weeks ago with the Vegas Golden Knights. Can yeah. you just touch on, you know, what goes in behind the scenes to those commercials? They're obviously so successful and you do a great job in them. And I actually know you grew up with Doug Ellen, so you might have some acting experience under your belt. Well, I know you've seen you in movies too. Yeah. So no, I don't have any acting experience. And uh, the anchors who do those commercials were not that funny. They're just really <laughs> well-written, you know, it's the advertising firm and it started with Wyden and Kennedy way back when. And the whole thing about it is they're just, they're understated, right? It's, it's less as opposed to more, which goes against everything we do right on sports center and the games we're screaming, Oh, crash, bang, boom. Wow. What a play. And, and the commercials are the exact opposite. They're understated. <laughs> Uh, the one with Eichel and Marsha so and the, putting the Stanley Cup in the dishwasher. You know, I don't say anything. It's just a smirk or a look. So that's the genius, I think, the brilliance of those spots. And it's fun to get to know those guys. You see the athletes in a different way. And uh, I always tell the athletes, hey, like, I don't care how good you, you are in this spot. We're going to do it 40 times. It doesn't matter if you nail it every single time. Uh, that's just television and film and uh, speaking of Doug Allen, I'm wearing, can you see my shirt here? That's Belmore Kennedy. Uh -huh. That was my high school. So that was me, Doug Allen, uh, the creator of Entourage. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenny Dichter, who is uh, Wheels Up. And was, yep. You know, invented Wheels Up. And uh, Adam Schefter, of course, too. So that's a pretty good uh, pretty good class in high school, huh? Yeah, that's a, a big three or a core four, I'd say. It's like Matthews, uh -huh. Marner, Nylander, and Tavares over there in <laughs> Belmore High School. Cool. With more success in the postseason, I'd like to see. <laughs> That's for sure. That's for sure. I actually wanted to ask you as well. You know, obviously, this is a question that I'm assuming you knew would come up. The Frozen Frenzy, a couple weeks yeah. ago, first of its kind. Uh, I don't know if you caught wind. I was kind of bragging about it for a couple weeks. I actually interviewed Kenny Albert a couple years ago and said the NHL needed somewhat of a uh, power play channel. Um, yeah. So, you know, I was, I was fishing for credit on that one. But uh, obviously, it went super well. Can you just talk about the making of that and what went into it. And people, some people might think it took like three weeks to just come up with the plan. And, and it's probably years in the making, right? So first things first. So I have friends at the NHL network and they're like, Hey, wow, ESPN gets behind this. And they do it in one night. You know, we've been doing this for 20 years. Like they do mm -hmm. have that show on the NHL network where they whip around every single night and go through the game. So I get it. But uh, once the ESPN PR marketing department throws their weight behind something, uh, a lot of times it can it can take off and catch fire. So maybe this was an idea last year. And really, I think it was ESPN, and I don't know this for sure, and I'm not involved in this piece of it, but I, I think it was ESPN's idea. We got a lot of really creative, smart people. I think we brought the idea of the NHL to the league, and kudos to the league for being open to try new things, you know, and, and see what we can make of this. And I thought for uh, uh, year one, it went really well. It, look, it's a scheduling nightmare for the league. We get that. I think they only had two games the night before and one game the night after, right? Just because of travel, how many games in a row can you play and how many consecutive nights, those kinds of things. And the fans had to deal with it too, right? There were some weird early face-offs, mm -hmm. some weird late face-offs in different time zones to stagger the starts. So uh, I think it was a really nice collective effort. Uh, I'd like to see it be done again. You know, and Butchie and Weeks, he really handled the heavy lifting. Mess PK and I were doing just another triple header. Um, but it was fun to be a part of. It got a lot of great buzz for the sport. It got people excited in a period of time where, you know, hockey's not really first and foremost, right? It's, you know, it's, it's late October. It's a Tuesday night. We got banged a little bit because we're up against, I think, game seven of a, a baseball uh, uh, was it the ALCS or the NLCS? NBA opening night. 
NBA opening yeah. night, TNT, right? So imagine on a different night, maybe we catch a break there and the numbers are even better. But anyway, I'd like to see it done again and, and maybe more than once in a season. Maybe yeah, hockey fans got a little greedy. Every, every time there's more than five games in the schedule, we need a frenzy. <laughs> right, right, right. And then the other night we did one game in the studio and I told those guys they were stealing money. You know, we go from the frenzy to one game, which is you know, two intermissions. Big deal. Whoops. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, but I also know that you're, you know, you're very open to the criticism, right? I've seen you comment on feedback from ESPN and whatnot. Speaking of new ideas, new innovative ways to grow the game, is there anything that you want to see be done with ESPN or just hockey in general? Listen, we're we're always trying to, to tweak it a little bit. I'm not sure what else you can do on the game broadcasts themselves. I think where ESPN shines is the before, the after, uh, all the promotion we can give to it. And listen, all due respect to our friends at TNT, you know, they're on really in a six hour window, one night a week, mm -hmm. right? And so we're sports all the time, 24 seven, ESPN plus the power play. And so I think that's really the value of ESPN, right? You know, you can put it on in the morning, get your highlights there and all that kind of thing. Sports center, you know, Van Pelt's got hockey guests on now after our big yeah. game. You know, TNT does it too, but again, that's one night we're doing it every single night. So you know, little things I'd like to see, and this is purely cosmetic. I've been fighting this home white uniform thing forever. I'm on board. Right? Yeah. And uh, so I did the game the uh, last week in Boston. The Bruins had their centennial home whites on, which are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. The Leafs came out in the road blues, two national anthems. Like, it was, it was perfect, you know? And so uh, that won't impact the ratings probably. It would make me feel better. <laughs> And I assure you, every time I see Commissioner Bettman, I mention it to him. So I was at the Garden last night, original six matchup, Rangers, Red ah. Wings. It would have been perfect to see the Rangers in white and Red Wings in those, you know, those beautiful red jerseys and uniforms that they wear. I, I think it's just, you know, to your point, I think all the fans should be able to see the teams in their colors, right? You, you, it's, you know, you got McDavid coming to town and you rarely see the Oilers like you want to see them in that in that shiny blue, you know? A lot of the whites look the same, right? So if you're yeah. the whole, if you're the, you know a visiting team, a visiting team for those season ticket holders who are the most important consumers, ask any club, right? That's the most mm. important people to them. And their bottom line, I think you want to see the colors of the visiting team. I yeah. think. Look, part of that is that's how we grew up. You know, back in my day, I couldn't get Ranger games. We couldn't get MSG on the island, so I only saw the Rangers on WOR Channel Nine when they were always in blue on the road. Mm -hmm. So to go to the garden, it was such a treat to see him in the white. It was, you know, it was like Yankee pinstripes. Like I'm, I'm weird about this stuff, Johnny. Like I don't think the Yankees <laughs> should wear pinstripes in spring training, like in, in their home games in Tampa. Like I think you should have to go to Yankee stadium to see the pinstripes, the cathedral. That stuff is, is sort of sacred to me. And I guess I get nerded out on the sweater uniform thing. No, I'm all for that. I think it's good to keep the traditions alive. Right. I think hockey is, you know, somewhat of that sport that's, now in a new era, this golden era that we talk about, but it's also yeah. important to keep those traditions of the past. I think it's a good yeah. mix of both. Everyone's argument is like, but when they were the alternates, they won't be able to do it at home. It's like, all right, they were the alternates eight nights right. a year. You know, it's not. And listen, I, I assure you, the league discusses this every year. It's absolutely on the table, but owners, owners are deciding. And yes, the alternate sweaters come into play and they're looking to sell as much merchandise as they can. And I, I get it. I understand. You know, there were some years where ESPN didn't have the rights of hockey. I'm sure that was a difficult time for you. But, yeah. you know, for a kid like me, I'm 27 years old. I grew up every morning turning on you and Barry Melrose talking hockey. And, you know, obviously Barry has, you know, stuff going on right now and whatnot. But I wanted to ask you about him and your relationship with him and just how you two in general have seen the growth of the game and how you've impacted it yourselves. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, you will find out you're already on a meteoric rise in the industry <laughs> yourself, John, but you'll find out like, you know, you become, you meet these people who you've never met before and you become colleagues and you work together. And then over time, if you're lucky, they become friends. And over even more time, if you're really lucky, they become your family. And, uh, and that's what Barry Melrose is to me. So, you know, we did a bunch of tributes to him and I want to reinforce because it's a fine line there. He's not dead. Like, he's fine. You know what I mean? He just <laughs> yeah. retired. He's like anybody else who retired. And he's dealing with some health stuff. But I talk to him almost every single day. He sounds great on the phone. Trying to get a, you know, a lightning game. So I can go down and see him there. Maybe in a Buccaneers game, we'll see him on ESPN radio. But um, he's just the greatest guy ever. And he's so much more than – he's everything hockey. But he's so much more than hockey. He's a, a history buff, both, both U.S. and Canada. Uh, so well read, constantly reading books, 
loves movies, science fiction, uh, period pieces. Like he's so much more than just hockey. And yet he is all about hockey. And really, he kept that light burning mm -hmm. for those 15, 16 years. We did not have hockey. Look, you know, Butchie and I were doing sports center still in the two. But Barry's the only hockey analyst. We have, you know, we have 30 NFL analysts, you know, 15 NBA analysts, 15 Major League Baseball, and one hockey analyst for the longest time. And it was Barry. Whatever time you needed. And you needed a 30-second duck sharks highlight at <laughs> 1.30 in the morning. Here comes Barry walking into the studio uh, looking like a million bucks. And uh, listen, I really believe he deserves to be in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. uh, not for his playing career, though he would tell you otherwise. <laughs> not for his coaching career, though he would tell you otherwise. Uh, but the Foster Hewitt for the broadcaster or contributor, whatever it is. Um, and, and what I would tell you is, if you're not sure, you walk through an airport with Barry Melrose, mm -hmm. and it's like Elvis. You know, he's rock star, and people run to him. They flock to him, pictures, autographs, and all because of one thing. And, and they know he's hockey and mm -hmm. what he has meant to hockey in the United States of America, especially when ESPN did not have the rights. Uh, I, I think he should already be in the Hockey Hall. And I know uh, myself and a bunch of our guys are going to try to fight that fight for him for the next class. Yeah, I think, you know, I speak for anyone listening as well. Like, you know, just want to see him back on TV, right? I think, uh, you know, I grew up watching him every day, like I said. Um, yeah. I also wanted to mention, you know, a good friend of mine who I actually met you with at Elbow Room, Emily Kaplan, um, you know, similar in, in that sense. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but, you know, I think it was probably like 1 a.m. or something. You you and Mess come strolling into Elbow Room and I'm with Emily Kaplan. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm too drunk to meet Mark Messier right now. Please do not introduce me. But I went up to you and I was like, what's up, Steve? How's it going? Let me buy you a beer. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I before I let you go, because I know we're kind of getting close on time, I do have to just get your favorite Mark Messier story, you know, working with him on the desk at ESPN or you know, whether it was covering, covering game seven back in 94, anything you've got with, with mess. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, listen, he's, he's hockey royalty, you know, he, he just is, I mean, everywhere he goes, he's so recognizable. And I think it's the face, right? It's the, it's the forehead or forehead, depending upon where you're from. That and selfie he, he took like a couple of weeks ago was, was pretty scary though. Huh? That Instagram post. I don't know if you saw it on like Halloween. I think he might've posted some. Oh yeah. He was, he was Elvis. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It was Elvis. He did a great job because he really didn't know it was Messier. Could have been <laughs> the costume was so good. Uh, PK looked like PK, and <laughs> I looked like me. There's not much you could do with that. So, uh, Mess and I disagree on two things pretty much. It's the temperature in the studio. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's from Edmonton. You would think he could handle a little chill in the air. He likes it warm. And um, the other thing is, we get into this argument about the Maple Leafs. Because to me, we can't learn anything about Toronto in the regular season. To me, we'll start to find out about these Leafs end of April, you know, end of that first round kind of thing. And Mess, who obviously knows quite a bit more than I do about the game, uh, he believes we're learning every single game in the regular season that you build up and uh, pieces of your play, how things change, uh, those kinds of things all add up. The bench decisions, the dressing room, practices, those little pieces all add up to what you become in the middle of April. And so and so we shall see. But uh, he's been great. It's obvious, We did a game at the Garden last year. So that was a really cool experience for me, you know, to walk into Madison Square Garden with Mark Messier. Yeah. And, you know, still all half the jerseys in the building, are, you know, have his number on it. The banner in the rafters, obviously. And uh, again, there's, you know, there's only a handful of guys and he's so modest. He doesn't want to take credit uh, really for anything. And, um, you know, we always rode shotgun to Wayne Gretzky, right? And he, mm -hmm. every time people want to give credit for, to mess for things in Edmonton, he always goes to Wayne. You know what I mean? That's just sort of the, who he is. That's hockey. That's the kind of guy he is. Uh, but he is, make no mistake, he is. He's probably underrated, actually, if you can believe that. And uh, he is he's hockey royalty. He just is. And I'm i am so lucky to be able to sit next to him and learn from him every single night. And uh, uh, it's been great. That's super cool. And it's been a blast watching you guys. And last thing before I let you go, yeah. if you had one message to Ranger fans this year who are now hopeful with their start under Peter Laviolette, what would you say to the you know Ranger fan base right now? I would say don't lose the hope. Uh, I know the start has been unbelievable, 
But a lot like I just said about Toronto, like I, I don't feel like we can learn anything about this Ranger team. They're going to make the playoffs, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to be there. They're not going to be, you know, ninth. They're going to be in some way, shape, or form. And I would also say, you know, look at the season the Bruins had last year. I feel like the division title means if it's not meaningless, it doesn't mean all that much. Just mm -hmm. get in the playoffs and be playing your best hockey come the middle of April. So I would say for Ranger fans, cautious optimism. They have the right pieces. The talent is there. There's no question about that. And um, I think you just got to be healthy and, and playing your best when it, when it matters most. Yeah, beautifully said. Thank you, Steve. I really appreciate you hopping on. And uh, hopefully we can do this again come playoff time when the Rangers are there. Let's do it again, Johnny. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And uh, continued success to you, pal. Thank you. Appreciate it.